Okay guys, so the first thing we have to look at here in the agency relationship, what is exactly an agency? So remember, it's a legal relationship. You're gonna have one person or possibly an entity, the principal, who's gonna appoint somebody else to act on their behalf. That other party's the agent. So just keep track of the facts when you read it, who's the principal, who's the agent, and who's the third party. Now, traditionally, the CPA exam, they love agency, and this is also the foundation for partnership and corporate law, so very, very important. But the CPA exam is generally gonna focus in on the following issues. Number one, what are the requirements for creating a valid principal agency relationship? So one of the big things you gotta remember is the principal has to have capacity and consent, but ironically, the agent need not have uh, capacity. So you can appoint a minor to be your agent. Why you'd wanna do that, I don't know, but you could do it if you want to. The rights and duties between the principal and agent, remember Laura. L-O-R-A, we'll get into that, compensate, possibly reimburse and indemnify the agent if these are reasonable expenses incurred in the ordinary course of that agency relationship. Then remember the authority that the agent has to bind the principal. There's three types of authority we're gonna go through. The actual, the apparent, and then if there's no actual or apparent authority, but the agent purports to be working on behalf of the principal, maybe the principal wanna ratify. We'll see about that. And then all the uh, matters related to liability of the party. So when's the principal liable to the third party? Is the agent potentially liable to the third party? So that's how it's gonna work. So let's take a look now at how our little PowerPoint's gonna play for you. My man, who's that, Mike Brown up there? So remember a guy named Walt, Walt Disney. He wanted to buy some land in Florida, expand his business. He had that Walt Disney land. He wanted Walt Disney World. And there was a lot of stuff for sale in Florida, but he certainly didn't want the world to know he was buying it for himself because that would have jacked up the price. So he appointed this guy in the swamp right there. I guess that's he's in the swamp. It'd be pretty cool if we had a graphic where an alligator came and like ate this guy. But nonetheless, this is the guy who's going to be negotiating on behalf of Walt. All righty. So now close your eyes, guys, and imagine... Imagine, it's early 1960. So Garrity was what, about 75 years old back then? So it's early 1960, you're a successful business owner and you wanna expand your California operations to Florida. You've set your sights on developing that worthless land, that swamp you were just looking at. It's cheap, it's plentiful, about $80 per acre. Now there are tens of thousands of acres for sale, it's perfect. But if word gets out that it's you, Mr. Walt Disney World, successful business person, you're the one buying up the swamp land, that's obviously gonna drive the price up. So what did Walt Disney do? So he hired a bunch of people to buy the land on his behalf, and then he told them not to tell anyone that they were buying it for him. So we know the principle was undisclosed. So really, this is a true story. This is how Walt Disney World came to be. I mean, Walt Disney got these people to purchase the land on his behalf. Those people were the agents. They had the actual authority to enter into those contracts on his behalf. He was the principal. And because Walt Disney specifically told the agents, don't tell anyone, that you're working on my behalf, well, we know that's that special type of relationship with an undisclosed principal. Remember, when the principal's undisclosed, there's no way to have apparent authority, and there's no way for the principal to ratify when they're undisclosed, okay? We'll talk more about that in a second. And by the way, when the third party doesn't know about the existence or identification of the principal, well, then the agent is gonna be liable Oh, uh, you know, to perform that contract. So the agent's liable. And then the principal's gonna be liable if the agent had actual authority. And then when the third party finds out the existence and identity of, of the principal, they're gonna have to choose who do they wanna hold liable. But when the principal's undisclosed, that's one of the situations where yes, the agent is liable to the third party. All righty. My man, look at this guy. So Walt the principal, actually that was my hairline like until I was like 25 years old. I mean, uh, I, really, pretty scary. But nonetheless, Walt the principal. To be a principal, you gotta have capacity, you gotta consent to the relationship, don't forget that. And remember, a writing is generally not required. It can be an oral agreement unless it involves the purchasing or selling of land like we had in this case, or you want that agreement to last more than a year, so the My Legs mnemonic. So if it's more than a year, you wanna hire them to be an agent for multiple years, should be in writing or buy or sell land. So the My Legs, the Y, and the L. 
Now, the agent we know need not have capacity, so it's kind of weird unless you study that. That's one of the things you wouldn't have known. And consideration is not a legal requirement to form a valid agency relationship. Now, unless you're told otherwise, it's presumed that the agent's going to get paid, but it could be gratuitous. The agent could agree to work for free. Okay, now in our example, the fact that Walt was undisclosed had no effect on the agent's actual authority. Actual authority comes from the instructions specifically given to the agent by the principal. So the fact that the agent is undisclosed has no effect on their actual authority. Okay, remember, actual authority arises from the communication between the principal and the agent. So there's that express actual authority, your specific oral or written instructions. And then there's the implied actual authority to do whatever's necessary to accomplish that goal or objective. Now, the principal's bound if the agent had authority. So whether it's actual or apparent authority, the principal is bound. Okay, so if the agent had any type of authority, the principal is bound. It's irrelevant that the principal's not disclosed or partially disclosed or undisclosed. Just remember, if the principal's identity is not known, then there's no way the agent can have apparent authority. Apparent authority only exists when the third party reasonably believes this agent is acting on behalf of the principal. Okay, so if the agent doesn't have authority, let's say, no actual no apparent authority. So if the agent has no authority whatsoever, no actual and no apparent authority, which we'll review in a second, then the principal can be bound if they choose to ratify. Now remember, for the principal to the ratify, the third party has to know of the existence and identi identity of the principal. So technically, it's almost as if the agent had apparent authority. They don't. They're trying to create it themselves. But with ratification, the agent is purporting to work on behalf of this principal. Okay, so it's not really apparent authority, but it's kind of like it. Okay, for a principal to ratify, don't forget, all the material facts have to be disclosed. And they got to ratify the entire transaction, not just part of it. Okay, now... Actual versus apparent authority. So with actual versus apparent authority, the actual authority we know express or implied that's your oral or written instructions. The big thing on the exam is the apparent authority or what they call a stopple. Okay, so now for the agent to have apparent authority, that's got to be because the principal did something or failed to do something that made third parties reasonably believe the agent could do this. So apparent authority can come from giving somebody a fancy title, partner, president, they have a position, manager, okay? Or if the agent quits or gets fired and you fail to give notice to the third parties that a, that agent quit or got fired, well then even though they no longer have the actual authority, they can still have the apparent authority to act on your behalf. And don't forget the secret limiting instructions. We're not talking about whispering in somebody's ears, but if the, uh, if the principal puts a limit on the agent and says, listen, I realize I'm making you the manager of my store, and I realize it's customary for managers to hire and fly, fire employees, but in this case, I'm actively involved. I want to pick all the employees. That's quote unquote like a secret limiting instruction. Okay, that will definitely destroy actual authority but that will not destroy apparent authority unless third parties are given notice of that limitation, okay? So that's the big thing there. Okay, with apparent and ratification, both of those situations are only possible, again, if the principal's existence and exact identity is known by the third party. For the principal to ratify, they have to be fully disclosed, and the agent has to have been purporting to work on their behalf. But remember, the agent can't create their own apparent authority. So it's almost like apparent authority, except it's not because the principal didn't create that perception. The agent's trying to create it for themselves, okay? But nonetheless, the agent has to be purporting to work on behalf of that principal. All righty, now the duties of the principal and the agent, unless we agree otherwise, compensation. Okay, so you could agree to work for free, but that would be the exception rather than the rule. Um, reimbursement and indemnification for reasonable expenses incurred in the course of that relationship. So it's got to be necessary, reasonable, things of that nature. And then remedies of the agent. If the principal fa fails to perform as agreed to, then the agent obviously can sue for breach of contract and then look to sue for compensatory and possibly consequential damages. Anything that's reasonably foreseeable, they should be able to collect. All right, on the flip side, here's that Laura mnemonic. Duties of the agent to the principal. You ready? Duty of loyalty, there's the L. No self-dealing, okay? No kickbacks. You're there to operate on the behalf of your principal, not for yourself, so no self-dealing. 
A duty of obedience. Sounds like a dog. The duty of obedience. You got to follow reasonable instructions. Now, your duty of obedience is not absolute. If they ask you to do something illegal or unethical, you should say no. So you should follow all reasonable instructions, okay? Reasonable care, don't be negligent, exercise reasonable care, so your due diligence, all that kind of stuff. And then the A in Laura, a duty to um, account, no commingling. Keep the principal's funds separate and apart from your own. Don't put anything on the business credit card for personal expenses, you know, so that no commingling, duty to account. So therein lies Laura. All righty. Let's do it. If it's January, Feb February, where are we traveling? Florida. You got to love it. The Sunshine State. The Sunshine, the palm trees of Florida. They got it better. Yes, they do. No state income tax. You got to love the state of Florida. So here we go. All of the land is accumulated by the agents, and then the land development begins. And all those people who sold to those agents got pretty upset when they found out it was Walt Disney World because they probably could have sold it for 50 times the price they got. But even though the principal's identity was unknown, doesn't matter. It's still a legal agreement. Okay. So now, when will the principal-agent relationship be terminated? Now, remember, there's a difference between having the power to do something versus the right to do it. So pretty much, the agency-principal relationship is at will. So as a general rule, the principal can fire the agent whenever they want. They have the power to do that. The agent can quit whenever they want. General rule. Remember, the one situation where the principal doesn't have the power or the right to terminate the agent is that agency coupled with an interest. But outside of that, this is a general rule of thumb. Even though there's an agreement to work for five years, the principal can fire the agent, the agent can quit. But that's the difference between having the power to do it and the right to do it. If there's a contractual agreement for you to work for me for three years as my agent and you quit, well, I might be able to sue you for breach of contract. You have the power to quit, but not the right, okay? So if there's no right to do it, then breach of contract. Sometimes the agency relationship terminates by operation of law. So remember all the operation of law situations. So for one, if the subject matter is illegal, right? You can't do something. You can't agree to be an agent to hire somebody. Uh, the agent is going to buy drugs on your behalf. So that agency relationship immediately terminated, okay? Death of either party, whether it be the principal or the agent, automatically terminated. Discharge and bankruptcy of the principal. If I can't pay you and you want to get compensated, that would automatically terminate the relationship. Remember, a realtor, a CPA, or a lawyer, failure to have the necessary license automatically terminated. There's no actual or apparent authority, so no notice is required, automatically terminated by operation of law. And then destruction of the subject matter. If I hire you to sell my house and the house burns to the ground, you're automatically terminated. Okay, so now let's take a look at another example. Let's apply these in some detail. Let's do it, baby.